Hi, good evening, everybody. This is so exciting. Um, I want to leap right into it because we have so many amazing panelists. Um, in any order that you would like, just get started and then uh, maybe call on the next person. Um, could the panelists each share a little bit about your journey in the film and tele or television industry? How did you get started and how did you get to where you are now? Uh, why don't I tap um, Carrie, please? Hi, so uh, I'm the class of 89. Uh, I love Hunter. It was, I feel like my favorite place still. Um, I love just the classes, my friends, the community, the whole thing. Um, I hope you're having as great an experience. Um, I'll talk really fast because I want to tell you my whole path. I went to college. I basically just took like the most interesting classes I could find. Um, I took really just cool classes and all different kinds of things. I ended up in East Asian studies, Japanese major. So um, from there, I was graduating at a hard time. All I knew is that I love school, love classes. I decided to go to law school, maybe not always the best choice for all the wrong reasons, but I just thought it would open more doors for me. I'd learn more. I'd study like some media, IP, entertainment stuff that I loved. <clears throat> it ended up working out for me, um, but not necessarily recommended unless you know why you're going. Um, then I worked at a law firm in New York for a couple of years, even though I really wanted to come to LA and do entertainment, but I just didn't want to leave New York yet. And I couldn't really, I had trouble finding a media job right out of law school. I then went from my law firm where I was for two years to an internet startup entertainment company. Um, it was very small. It was really fun. It was one of my favorite jobs I've ever had. I came out to LA for that to do a TV pilot. Unfortunately, I moved here on September 4th, 2001. So we very quickly folded up our company. It was a super fun, funny idea. It was at the wrong time. Um, and all I wanted to do was come back to New York at that time and be with my people during a dark time. But I stayed here and a friend brought me over to Disney where they said, I think you'll really like it. You should be a lawyer. You should come work at ABC. You'll meet all these people. You'll have so much fun. You love TV. And so I came, I said, okay, I'm going to do this for one year. And then I'm going to go back and be an entrepreneur. And now I'm here over 20 years and I make deals for different shows, different kinds of people. I think one of the goals of this panel is hopefully for you guys to see all the different kinds of jobs there are, which I had no idea. Um, so I make deals for different shows and across the different platforms at Disney and TV. And I was supposed to be here for one year, but it's interesting and I love it. And that's my story. Um, how about Chala? All right. Um, class of 87. I am a filmmaker, though, so I'm on the creative side. What they don't tell you is you also need to know something about business to be successful. <laughs> but my entry is very organic because uh, coming up in the 80s, like who was a filmmaker? I liked history. I, I was a liberal arts honors student at college and I loved discovering literature and history. And because my father was a history professor, I knew I didn't want to become a PhD. I wanted to visualize history in some way. And so I got my master's in American history and public history resource management. And I was going to be a curator in a historical institution using the artifacts and evidences of history to bring stories alive. Well, cut back in the arts when, when I graduated and there were no jobs. And a friend of mine was like, have you ever heard of this guy named Ken Burns? I was like, yeah, Civil War baseball. Um, and I sent my letter in and it got filed away. But, and this is to promote a liberal arts education, I was at an art gallery opening. It was contemporary African art. And there were these two guys talking in the corner, distinguished gentlemen, they were talking about film. And I went over because I was not get it. I was not employed. I was not being employed. And turns out that one of them was a producer for Ken Burns. And we talked about Caribbean studies, art, literature, music, et cetera. And at the end of the conversation, he said, and actually it was also a famous filmmaker, Horace Ovey, the two of these men talking together. Um, and he gave me his card and said, send me your resume. But I had just come from um, 
an interview at the Brooklyn Historical Society where they were like, we'd love to hire you. We hope you're unemployed in six months. That was terrible. But the good news was I had my resume with me and I was dressed professionally. I handed it to him. This was before cell phones, people. <laughs> I don't even think we were doing internet research. He invited me in and I learned how to make films on the job. For the next five years, I worked for Florentine Films and Ken Burns and his producing team on Frank Lloyd Wright about the American Architect and the jazz series. And at the end of that experience, I was like, wow, I can't even believe this is a job. And I wanna see if I can be a director. And that's how I got started. So next, Jaheen. Hi everybody, um, I'm Jahan Robinson. Um, it's okay, <laughs> it happens all the time. And I also don't work at Freeform. I actually uh, work at a brand called Onyx Collective that's a part of Disney Entertainment. Um, and my journey to the entertainment industry was sort of not a straight line. I was actually really influenced um, by the work that I did in art history at Hunter. Um, and Dr. Eisenstadt was a huge mentor to me. So I actually um, left high school going to college on a track to work in the art world um, in curatorial. Um, and then I got out of college and I realized that the art world was not my people, but I stayed in it for about seven years. Um, went on to get my master's in arts administration. And it was while I was getting my master's that I shifted gears to film because as I'm sure many of you understand and know, growing up in New York City is just such a blessing because you are surrounded by the arts. So if I wasn't in a museum or a gallery, I was in a movie theater. Um, and I really wanted to see how I could break out into that part of the industry. So while I was in grad school, I did a bunch of in internships in different parts of the industry. So I worked for an independent director. I worked for a film nonprofit. I worked for a sales agency that sort of packages and sells films um, to sort of figure out where I wanted to land. And then when I got out through one of the relationships in one of those internships, I got a job sort of starting my career over as an assistant at HBO Documentary Films where I became um, just absolutely in love with documentaries. Um, and at the time, you know, documentary distribution was really kind of just HBO documentary films, PBS, and then, you know, a couple of theatrical distributors that would support films here and there, but it wasn't the industry that it is now. Um, and I loved it. And I remember sitting in my interview and them telling me that there was no um, opportunity for growth. And I was like, well, you haven't met me yet in my mind, but there was no um, opportunity for growth. So I ended up staying there for about five years and then um, wanted to shift gears into a more senior role. And everybody kept telling me I had to come to LA, which I really did not want to do as a native New Yorker. But I worked in this weird intersection of making documentary films for a cable, you know, premium cable network in the height of sort of reality television. And those were sort of what all the New York jobs were and nonfiction storytelling outside of public media. So um, I didn't know how to drive. I came and used my vacation days to come to LA. My boyfriend at the time drove me to all of these informational interviews. Um, and he had probably only had about five hours of driving experience himself as a native New Yorker. And one of those meetings led to an opportunity um, in LA where I worked for a company called Participant Media, where they were starting a television network focused on millennials and participants' whole ethos was about, um, you know, creating entertainment to inspire and compel social change. So it still felt rooted in my um, sort of values and goals and wanting to work in documentary film. And there I got all of my episodic storytelling training um, as an executive. Um, and then from there, just continued on the executive track. I went on to work at Netflix and the original documentaries team. I then went to the sales side, uh, working for a studio called um, uh, Topic Studios. And then um, please do not judge me. I went to go lead documentaries at Quibi, which was, you know, we made great docs, you guys. And if you had an opportunity to watch, I think there's still some on Roku. 
Um, but that was an incredible experience. And I've worked at a lot of different startups and always like really working at startups within the industry, which also then led me to Disney, where I did start at Freeform when they wanted to sort of revamp their programming for a Gen Z audience to be more rooted in documentary storytelling. And while I was there, there was an opportunity to work on a new brand within the Disney um, ecosystem called Honest Collective that's focused on underrepresented creators and the stories they want to tell. So I oversee documentaries there um, and, you know, love the work that I do and have been working in docs for about 16 years at this point. Um, but not a straight line um, to get where I did, um, where I have, um, but I, um, I'm happy to be here. Um, so I'll pass it to Danny Bernfeld. Thanks, Jahan. I, uh, similarly, when I moved to LA, I didn't have a driver's license and it was a terrifying experience. So for those of you still at Hunter, take driver's ed. Um, I, you know, I think I really fell in love with, with film and TV in a lot of ways, uh, because I was kind of like examining American history through the lens of cinema, which is something like a passion of mine that really started when I was at Hunter and took Mr. Kagan's class. Um, and I graduated from Hunter and I went to Vassar and I ended up majoring in film and building a minor in the history of the Cold War um, and specifically looking at the history of the Cold War as kind of reflected through, through cinema. And I actually had a pretty straight traditional line um, in the entertainment business. You know, I think the entertainment business is very much an apprenticeship based business still. And so I, you know, intern when I was at college, I interned for two summers at a company called Focus Features. And I was that, you know, really outgoing intern. And it got me a, you know, uh, assistant job at the company. And uh, that was my first job out of school. And I, uh, through a series of kind of strange circumstances, I was the second assistant to two executives. And um, one of the executives ended up, Focus Features is a subsidiary of NBC Universal at the time. And one of the executives, David Lindy, ended up becoming the chairman of Universal. And he kind of asked me if I wanted to stay with him. And he was moving to LA and I have to move to LA. And I very kind of, without really thinking it through, said, of course, I want to move to LA. And ended up moving with him. And I stayed on as David's assistant for four and a half years. And it was a unbelievable opportunity to see the business from the top down, because when you're kind of sitting um, on all the phone calls and in all the meetings of a chairman level executive, it really is grad school. And it was a truly, truly incredible opportunity. And um, I was really burnt out at the end of it. because It was also one of those kind of very intense, very high octane jobs. And um, when David got fired, which is kind of like the only thing that happens to studio executives eventually, when David got fired, I ended up um, leaving the business for a year and running operations for a software startup. Um, and it ended up being some of the most interesting experience I could have had because it really taught me a lot about management um, and managing people, which ended up coming in handy kind of in many other roles I had. Um, and I ended up meeting a woman who kind of sat at the intersection between kind of tech and content. And she was working at Paramount and it was kind of the early days of kind of what ended up becoming Netflix and Hulu and all these kind of online distributors. Um, she was starting a low budget division at Paramount and we ended up doing low budget movies for Paramount and we started making digital content and we had content on Hulu and we had content on Yahoo. And it was right before kind of all of these places became really just TV distributors. And so I kind of got to sit at the intersection between tech and digital and kind of watch that transformation happen, which was really, really interesting. And I ended up um, moving up from being a junior executive at Paramount to being a senior executive at Paramount. And I worked on the TV side for a while and then worked on features. And I was um, an executive on a feature there and ended up meeting Peter Chernin and Jenno Topping, who ran Chernin Entertainment, and they brought me over to work for them as a producer. Um, and I worked for Peter and Jenno for a number of years, and I produced a movie called Ford vs. Ferrari with Matt Damon and Christian Bale for them. Um, and then I actually wanted to go out and try and produce on my own, and uh, that was September before COVID hit. And I quickly realized that that was not the great, the best time to uh to produce on my own and I ended up partnering with filmmakers called the Safdie brothers 
Um, and I worked with Josh and Benny for a number of years and I helped them build a TV business and build an unscripted business. Um, and, uh, as I was kind of nearing the end of that, I had a long time relationship actually for my first job as an assistant at universal pictures. Um, a person that I had a relationship with then became the COO of a company called Artist Equity, which is Matt Damon and Ben Affleck's production company. And they brought me on to run the creative division for them. So that's what I'm doing now. Uh, I will pass it off to Layla. It's Layla, actually. Um, so I went to Hunter. I loved it. It was um, an amazing place. Uh, but when I was there, I feel like we got pressured a lot to like figure out who we wanted to be when we were applying to college. Um, and I had no idea. And I was like, oh, I like animals. So I was pre-vet at Cornell when I graduated Hunter. And I say this because like I, I have a teenager and I feel like there's this tremendous pressure. You know, we have a lot of kids on here. So I just want to say like, it takes a minute. Take all the classes in college, learn it all. I had so I went to college. I I left pre vet after a year because I it was really intense, uh, and also I felt like I had a creative side that was not being expressed. And um, you know I did some theater there, and I got into really into theater. And um, I moved to New York, and I went to theater school. Uh, and like everyone else, I tried as hard as I possibly could to never ever leave New York, um, but it was hard to make a living as a playwright. Um, so I came out here to try to make it in to TV. Uh, and I've been, um, I mean, it took a long time. <laughs> Fast forward, took like three, four years of really working every angle and trying very, very hard. And then like, just like a fluke, I got my first job. And I've been a TV writer for uh, like 19 years. I will pass it to Jocelyn. Thank you, Lila. Um, I'm Jocelyn Jansons. I'm a class of 90 with Lila also. Um, I started Hunter in the second grade uh, because my brother got in in the preschool and they let siblings in at the time. So I scooted on over, uh, which was a great, um, I'm really grateful my parents decided to do that. Um, I started, uh, again, through Hunter, uh, someone came to our uh, sixth grade classroom and was scouting for NBC. And I wound up on two kids' news shows for NBC from sixth grade through my junior year of Hunter. Um, and it was Hunter that really supported that, that I was able to go work full time and still take classes and be a part of the Hunter community. So I was really grateful. And what I realized is that as much as I wanted to be Annie when I was like six, seven and eight and be on, on camera, I thought I actually didn't like it at all, but I loved what all the other people were doing. I loved what the writers were doing, the, the cinematographers, all the sound guys, and they were all incredibly generous. So I had boot camp throughout Hunter that got me um, hooked on this industry. Um, I wound up working for Maria Shriver. I actually just saw two days ago in a nail salon here on Montana Avenue in Santa Monica and said hi um, through the ICY program at Hunter. So my senior year, I hung out with Maria and realized I didn't want to be on camera at all. or And I also didn't want to work in journalism. Um, so that was a great experience. And I'm really grateful that I got that out of my system because I wound up studying film uh, when I went to Brown, which was um, a perfect fit. I loved it right away. Loved the courses. It was a really interdisciplinary um, program. So I got to study almost everything, um, but mostly sort of semiotics and film theory, which was weirdly helpful <laughs> as much as we joked while we were in it that it wasn't gonna be useful. It's been incredibly useful. Um, but I echo what the other amazing women here are saying to the students who are listening that I think the more broad you can be in those early years, the more you can kind of try on a lot of different things. Um, the more useful that can be. It was really, really helpful that I studied art history and science and history that I traveled. I did a junior year abroad. That was probably the most life-changing of the college years was to go to Italy for a year um, in terms of my film career. So just really second that to all the women who said that already. Um, so after college, I was uh, jobless. I was waiting tables at the Cactus Cafe 
Um, it was actually during, actually it's after my junior year and my mom said, well, you can't, you know, just st sit home. So work for me. I, I need to rent out this apartment. And the very first person who came in was a location scout for Hal Hartley, who is my personal idol. He was an indie filmmaker, very popular at the time. Um, so he said, look, they're hiring. You should go get a job. So I started location scouting and then worked my way up the production chain. It was the height of Miramax. Miramax was kicking off. All the indie, indie films were in New York. So I traveled with them. Carrie Arendt um, was the producer who I worked with the most um, and just gave me a lot of opportunity. I worked really, really hard, kind of like Danny was saying. I, I was the ultimate can-do, what-do-you-need kind of assistant. And I loved every minute of it. It was my, um, I, I knew it was the right feel for me because the moment I got on set, I was so, I felt like I was at home. Um, so that was great. Um, I ran the Nantucket Film Festival's first year. And then a movie I did in El Paso, Texas for Miramax brought me to LA. And there I was hired to be an AP on Chuck and Buck. So that was Mike White, who, um, you know, White Lotus, Mike White, and Mike Miguel Arteta and Matthew Greenfield. And so to work to move from New York, which I very reluctantly also did um, to LA, but to fall in with this really scrappy group of guys. Um, and then also Beth Colt, who was starring in the movie, um, was huge. You know, they were incredibly generous and excited that I was in town. And while I found um, New York felt a little bit like once you were location managing, you had to keep location managing. They were kind of trying to keep you in the track. Whereas LA felt kind of infinite in terms of like where you could move, which I really loved. Um, so I did that for a bunch of years. I worked, um, Beth Colt started her own uh, reality television company for women. So I directed for her for five years doing um, women-based content, uh, following the world's uh, sky surfer champion female and um, women who are going behind the scenes on features like um, Monsters Ball. Um, so I directed. And then uh, on a fluke, I moved to New Mexico, um, where I started teaching at the College of Santa Fe, making my short films and screenwriting full time, um, which was really amazing just to be in Santa Fe and to just have that level of um, freedom and and um, and all the things I did there. I founded a nonprofit called uh, New Mexico Girls Make Movies to bring women into the film industry, um, which was really exciting. And then um, I won a, an award for a screenplay I'd written um, and George R.R. Martin gave me the award, Game of Thrones. And we wound up directing it as a play at his theater. So that kind of led to a whole bunch of opportunities. Um, one of which was the NBC Universal Directors Initiative, which brought me back to LA um, where I'm now uh, gonna direct my first feature. Um, we just attached cast and George is on as the executive producer. So we're very happy to be back here in LA and um, excited to be here talking to you guys today. Um, I will pass it off to Manette. Thanks, Jocelyn. It's fascinating to hear everyone's origin stories. It's amazing. Um, so I um, was born in New York City, like most of you, and grew up just seeing film sets everywhere and becoming fascinated by the circus that they were. And had always been specifically interested in producing and how to put together that whole circus. Um, and that, that merged with my love of storytelling, which was um, encouraged and nurtured at Hunter. My favorite classes were English classes um, and Spanish classes. We had Senor Diaz would show us uh, Pedro Almodovar films, um, which were amazing. I, I can't, I don't know why, like well, how he was allowed to show Time Me Up, Time Me Down to a bunch of 15 year olds, but he did. And it was amazing. Um, and then, so after that, I ended up um, going to Harvard and studying East Asian studies, but specifically focusing on Chinese film and literature. So again, with the storytelling, staying in that, area. Um, and then after college, I was, I thought about going, moving to LA and, and doing film, but I just didn't think it was a very, and my parents didn't think it was a very practical thing to do. So I ended up working, um, I staying in New York and working at Time Magazine and working in consumer marketing there um, because I had loans to pay off. Um, so I did that for a while, then moved to the internet space and worked for a consulting firm where we met a whole bunch of startups. This is in the in first internet 
boom, basically, in, in the late 90s. And one of the people that we met was Reed Hastings of Netflix, uh, which had just launched at the time. It was really interesting. Um, I still have the deck that he presented. And um, so it's it's crazy how it's just taken over the world since then. Um, and then after that, I went back to Time Inc. Um, at sportsillustrated.com and worked in business development there. So again, media, very media business focused. And then it was there, uh, I was there when 9-11 happened. And that was another one of those big events that like the pandemic that sort of made people rethink what they were doing with their lives. And I thought that this was the right time. I was in my late 20s. I thought it was the right time to finally try out this film thing that I've always been interested in, but too afraid to try. Um, so I didn't know anybody in film. My parents are immigrants from China and Hong Kong. Um, so I ended up you know, answering an ad to be a volunteer PA on an NYU student film. Um, and I basically was rubbing coffee grounds on a Jersey City, in a, on, on the wall of Jersey City motel room. And I had an amazing time. <laughs> um, and the star of that movie was Mark Duplass, little short film. Um, and then at the I just worked, uh, I just wrapped the feature on Friday actually. And the deep, my DP, was the sound guy on that little short and my director was the DP on that little short. So, um, you know, film is all about like building relationships and sustaining them through many years. That was over 20 years ago. Um, so from that one PA gig, I ended up, you know, befriending a lot of filmmakers or film students at the time and NYU didn't have a producing program. So I ended up producing three NYU thesis films um, and learned producing that way um, and then moved on to producing features. My first feature I looked out and ended up producing uh, Mutual Appreciation by Andrew Bajowski, which is part of the whole mumblecore movement that you may have heard of. Um, and then just produced more features and more features and just indie producing became almost like an addiction really because you know it doesn't really pay. It's, it's not a job that can sustain you. So, um, so I did end up having to then take a job that sustained me, which was um, working for the Hawaii Film Office for a couple of years. My parents moved to Hawaii um, after I graduated from high school. And um, so I ended up working at the Hawaii Film Office and wrote their production tax credit. Um, and then came back to New York and you know went back to producing indie films. Again, ran out of money because any film doesn't pay. <laughs> it still doesn't pay. Um, and then lucked out by getting um, a job running a new company called Game Changer Films, which is uh, basically an equity, the first equity fund uh, that financed women directed narrative features. So um, while I was there, we financed 10 feature films, including Karin Kusama's The Invitation and Jennifer Fox's The Tale. Um, and then my cynic, when my cynic game changer was over, um, I went back to indie producing again. Um, and then the pandemic hit. And, um, and then I lucked out and ended up getting a call about potentially, about interviewing for um, a job as a full-time Columbia professor in their producing program. So that's my other, my day job now. So I'm a full-time producing professor at Columbia's Graduate Film School and I'm producing on the side. So um, that's basically my story so far. Who's next? Who's left? Is, is there anybody left? We have Hello. Leslie, please, thank you. I'm right here, yes. Um, well, I was inspired by my sister to try out for Hal Jackson's talented teen pageant. He was a radio personality at the time. So I tried out, and I was thinking, I didn't sing or dance like my sister, what could I do? But I was always writing stories. I was always a storyteller. I am an actor now, so that kind of makes sense, right? So I wrote my own monologue and I got into the competition. I didn't win, I was one of the finalists. But by being on that stage, I got bitten by the proverbial acting bug, right? So I did everything I could, found different theater companies to get involved in, was in plays and just everything I can do, do acting classes, and I went to college for, I was a theater major. Um, and when I graduated from there, I got a scholarship to go to Lee Strasberg um, Theater Institute down 14th, 14th Street. And, um, and then when doing all my homework and research about making a living, because I still wasn't doing what I, what I wanted to do, what I loved doing, it was really, really hard. Um, 
Uh, I just was asking everyone in front of the camera, behind the camera, clear to people, experienced actors, you know, how do you do this? What should I do? And I was advised to go to LA. At the time, you know, it was a certain a period of time that was pilot season. So they said, if you go to LA, go for half the year, beginning of the year, or you have to move there. And I was like, wow, okay. And so again, that's what I did. And it was the right decision because I, since I've been here, I, you know, started working in theater. There's theater in Los Angeles. Even though I know I'm a New Yorker. I love New York, but there's great theater here in Los Angeles. Um, I've done some and um, doing commercials, film, you know, films, um, even some podcasts that are very new right now. That's the trend, right? Podcasts. Um, and I'm still doing it. I actually have like three auditions this week and I just booked a film that I start next week. So it's, it's ongoing. It's never ending. I love it. And it was the right decision because what they said to me, they meaning those that I interviewed was that there was more earning potential in the time. And I think there still is and more opportunities. So that's why I'm here and I'm still doing it, still loving it. And like my other panelists, I didn't really have any other um, interest in any other part of the industry. I mean, I write, but writing, I was writing short stories. I wasn't writing something that was going to transfer to film or television. But, but I have. I, had, I have written two um, short films that I directed, produced, and, and started because I've you know, got to do everything with a filmmaker. So, um, but I was really like laser focused once I knew I wanted to be an actor. I just did everything I could to find out how to be that actor, to be that, that best actor. I think that's awesome. What you guys are talking about has kind of laid a blueprint of sorts in so many different areas. Also, that the path doesn't necessarily have to be straight in order to achieve success. And so I do want to take that away. Everyone's story was a little bit different, but because you guys have touched on so many aspects of the business, I think that that's really what makes it useful. Um, in that same trend, and we do have a lot of questions coming in, so I'm going to try to make this um, super cool and, and just as, you know, painless as possible. But I do want to kind of delve a little bit more into some of the challenges that you guys have faced as, you know, trailblazers in this industry. Um, yes, as a woman, some as a woman of color. Um, can you please, I'm going to start with Carrie, and then I want to, I want to um, volley it over to Shala, if you can weigh in as well, about just some of the challenges that you've had to overcome or obstacles that maybe you face or that you continue to face. Uh, I'll go fast. I, I ended up lucky and I've had many uh, women bosses. Um, you know, so that was fortunate in certain ways. Um, I have felt that in my job, in my role, there are, there is representation of women, um, not as many, um, uh, women of color until more recently, although I do feel like there are stronger efforts, never enough, but there have been stronger efforts more recently, um. And I know for my group um, that we focus a lot on just having all different kinds of people. Um, I do think that at the top, top, it's still very male. I do think that there's, you know, still really big pay equity issues. And I do think that we still have a ways to go in a lot of ways. But I think this business compared to others, um, there are a lot of women. Um, I do think um, part of the challenge for me was, you know, trying to have some type of balance in my life um, and having, you know, wanting to be present at home more than um, a little bit. And, you know, that's just, that's something you have to focus on and work hard on and figure out how to make happen and make choices about where you're going to work and who you're going to work with, if that's what's important to you. That's, that's sort of what I'll say. And I'll hand off to, back to Sean. Sure. I mean, I'll weigh in from the creative side. Um, as a director, I, I, I've worked in a very independent space. So coming out of Ken Burns' shop, I wanted to make a particular kind of film and I didn't want it centered on white guys. 
Like I wanted to know what it was like to center black women in stories. So I made a film about Shirley Chisholm and her run for president before anybody was talking about Shirley Chisholm or would really talk about her run for president. And the amount of resistance you get when you're centering women's stories, when you're centering stories about um, black women is really intense. I have a million stories and it, it, it range. And then I walk in the room and, you know, I smile or I'm friendly or whatever. So I don't look like, I don't know, like Alex Gibney or Michael Moore, right? Like the, 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 it is the expectation from the executives that you're dealing with and the fundraisers you're dealing with. And so the smartest thing is deciding what you want and then the strategy on how to get it. Um, and then it's like, it's fun. It's, it's like math. <laughs> it's like, it's a calculation. Um, I'll give you one example, you know, so then I went on to make a film about Angela Davis, free Angela and all her uh, political prisoners, again, centering a radical woman's story. At that time, um, it was right after 9-11 and none of the funders, the grantors or on the corporate side were interested in telling a story about a terrorist and she was not a terrorist. And in fact, I even have a meeting um, with participant at the time, and they had just done the Chicago 10, a story about 10 men um, in, in 1968 in the trial. And the executives there were like, well, we just did a story so similar and it had nothing to do with women. And so these are the things you navigate. I actually ended up having to find um, French producers and a third of the budget came from France where they were like, oh la la, Angela. And, you know, so you go and you find, like, when I started in the business, I had no idea that I could be where I am. And, you know, I'm sitting in the editing room. I just finished with my editor. We're working on a big project for Apple. I'm working on another project with some a billionaire investor. So what my advice, and I'm in the academy, like, you know, because of the network and 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 the quality of the work. So what I would say is, Whatever you make, remember that your name goes on it and it goes out there and becomes your calling card. And no matter who will react to you as a woman or a person of color, you have the work. And then you find your tribe, right? You find the people who can see you and see your work and you start to build and build and build. And 30 years later, I, I mean, here you have you turn around and you have this career that you didn't quite imagine and the best part is you're behind the camera so you have at least 30 more <laughs> but yes it can be depressing when you're just thinking uh, but you you just got to figure out the math on it and figure out what kind of life i think care what carrie said what kind of life you want to live um how much money you want to make and and how you diversify in order to do that Thank you for sharing that. I think you kind of also added in a little bit about, you know, the strategy that it takes in order to see more inclusion and to include, you know, um, people of color, women, men, any group that has not really been represented as well. Um, I think that both of you touched on that and work-life balance. Um, I did want to ask Jahan, did I pronounce that correctly? Yes, I did want to ask Jahan, um, is there a takeaway, a message that you would want to leave for the students that they can use as maybe fundamental information um, while they are at the level that they're in now? I mean, I think what it comes down to is what a value that you learn at Hunter very clearly is that you just have to work hard and you have to have find, you know, your own independent spirit within that work right like we were sort of taught there to have value in our beliefs and our worldviews to be critical of the world around us um and that to succeed you really have to put the hours in right and it's like working in film and television is not for you know the weary or the you know the sort of weak hearted you are constantly advocating for yourself. You're advocating for the projects that you want to stand behind. Um, you're working really hard to, you know, at least in my, you know, role, sort of find ways to make them connect to the audience um, in a way that 
a corporate investment can then allow you to make more and more of the things that you like to do. So I think it's just, it just really comes down to sort of tenacity and hard work and proactivity. No one's going to give it to you. You kind of have to go and get it. Another thing I really think is really important, which is just a general value, um, is you got to say thank you to everyone around you. You know, um, this is like a relationship business as, you know, Manette was saying, and there's going to be a lot of jerks that come across the way, but uh, working on a film or working in a corporate environment as an ecosystem where your reputation and how you treat and value people matters and will carry you through. And those two words I've found have gone a really long way in helping to sustain me, um, you know, across my career. Thank you. That's fantastic. And, and can I just add that that is saying thank you to the people up, but also thank you to the people down. I mean, oh, I got a, a PA who who was great, and it, he turned out to be an incredible DP. And I called him, and I didn't even remember that we had worked as a PA. And he walked in the office and took the job. And he, but because it was a good relationship, and he it was, and he was treated well. Thank you. All right, um, so we are approaching the end of our hour. Um, I want to do one rapid fire round, this time starting with Leslie, um, and then we're going to uh, see if we have time for some audience questions. I know that all, everyone has busy schedules and we really appreciate the panelists. The rapid round question is, if you were stranded on a desert island and you can only bring one TV show or movie with you, what would it be? Leslie, get us started. Thank you. I'm a rom-com fan, so it's probably unfair to say one, but the Bridget Jones trilogy. <laughs> yes, awesome. How about Manette? Okay, the nerd in me says the Up series by Michael Apted. <laughs> and oh. what I would really want is the Friday Night Lights. <laughs> you snuck in too. Um, all right, but hey, why not? Jocelyn. I'll go with the, the nerd in me and then what I really want. I like that, Manette. I, uh, the nerd in me would want to take like the um, dogma films like Celebration or Fish Tank, like the ones I just have taught me so much, but I really just want to take the holiday, something like that, a real goofy rom-com. <laughs> Rom-coms rule. Um, so Lila. Um, well, when I'm stressed out, which I imagine I would be on the desert island, um, I like to watch Top Chef. So I would bring all the seasons of Top <laughs> Chef with me. That sounds amazing, except maybe it'll make you hungry. Uh, Danny? Say Homicide Life on the Street, seasons uh, one through seven. Ah, <laughs> uh, you know, okay, yeah. Uh, Jahan? Um, the first thing that popped in my head was When Harry Met Sally. I watch it every year on Christmas. But then I also oddly watch all seasons of Game of Thrones during my maternity leave like three times. <laughs> So I feel like that might carry me through also, but I would hire Miss Alec for sure. Amazing. Uh, Charlotte. Sure. I'd want something bingeable, so I'd want all the seasons of Blackish for fun. Um, but in terms of docs, there's so many. I would say every Errol Morris film. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, Carrie. Oh, you see my Blackish poster? <laughs> Um, okay, so I kind of wanted to say Game of Thrones, but really I would be super stressed out and I am going to also go volume play. So I think I might do like all the seasons of like Parks and Rec or maybe Seinfeld, but I would want to laugh and like just, I feel like I could watch Game of Thrones over and over again and like still miss stuff. So I think I could really, but I think I'd go a comedy, a classic and one with like 10 plus seasons. So I, if I was there a long time. Uh, Seinfeld for the New Yorker and us, right? Um, so uh, let's now uh, open the floor to uh, some audience questions. Also, um, uh, 
when, when it gets to be eight o'clock, this is the teacher of me speaking now. If people have commitments, if people need to go, uh, we thank you so much for being a part of this experience and, um, you know, hope that you will continue to join um, Hunter uh, HS, HC, HSAA events in the future. This is just such a nourishing space. Uh, if somebody wants to ask a question, please go ahead and raise your hand or unmute yourself. Great, Daisy, please. Hello, I'm Daisy. I wanted to say thank you so much for coming. I, I'm i currently actually, I'm technically an alumni, even though I look really young. I'm, I'm a sophomore um, at NYU Film. Um, so this is like, of such a like niche audience like for hunter people to work in film i feel like when i was at hunter i was surrounded by all my science friends and math friends so it is really nice to be able to like connect and see that you can go to hunter and be successful in film and it is also slightly worrying i thought i'd be able to stay in new york as a long time new yorker but it seems like i'll have to move to la which i've like previously like I've set in my heart, but it's just, it's hard to leave here. But um, anyway, thank you again for coming. Um, I wanted to ask if you had any advice for what to do, like right out of college. I still have a couple years left and I am at film school already and I'm doing a, a minor in entertainment business. Um, I'm hoping to work in producing or the business aspect of film and tv but um yeah if you had any like advice for um, a young girl coming out of college i'm going to direct the question first to minute and then if there's another person who wants to weigh in cool but since you're in a college space in a way does that yeah. make sense yeah totally i can totally answer this question i mean i think you should be there's so much difference between what you learn in school, it's theory versus like what's actually out there in reality and practice. So I would encourage you to start doing internships now so you can really understand what it means to cover a script and you, you understand what development is versus production versus distribution and marketing. And so if you wanna be a producer, you kind of have to learn all those steps. Um, and it's very hard to do in a classroom, I think. You can supplement what you learn in the class with what you experience in real life. Um, but that's what I would suggest that you can really start to figure out like what your interests actually are. Um, and then once you figure that out, then you can target those jobs, those full-time jobs um, to apply to. Great, uh, thank you. Um, does anyone else want to jump in? I would say join hey. any organizations that are related um you know women make movies was really huge for me a bunch of um, film independent and where you can go to hear p other people speak and connect with them yeah i was going to say the same thing and something that i think you said before about finding your tribe or finding your community deep as an actor I, I i obviously i know directors and producers and writers i you know i interact with all of them even in, even in a social way but find your community and getting involved in those organizations and building those relationships so which, which i'm just repeating and you know agreeing with what's been said but that's really important to find your community i would also add that if you um i think too often people feel when you're young or at least i felt this way that you're not ready to make something yet you've got to go work and be of service which i i think is also important but start producing or making your own films with your group of students now, because it's amazing how much you learn, like Manette was saying, by doing. But even doing your own work, short films at school, grab, you know, you guys all have film studios in your hands that we didn't have when we were coming up. You can make amazing things on iPhones right now, um, write, write with your friends, produce, you know, really just get, get your feet wet and making your own work. Because I think that also will help you as Leslie was saying, like find your group and really um, connect with them. And then that continues through now, you know, it'll continue the rest of your life, these, re these friendships from school. Yeah, and just connect with as many people as you can. Ask people for informational interviews. I think it's a thing that's been said kind of over and over again, but relationships are gonna be the most important thing for you. And especially I think on the business side of film and, and producing, 
you will come back to those relationships over and over again. And I, I really can't stress enough, at least for me on the business side of film, how effective internships were for me. It's really hard to get that first assistant job because it's a really competitive thing. And, and again, like I really do think um, that side of the producing side of the business is a really apprenticeship based job. So having an internship as experience to point to when you're trying to get that first kind of real job out of college is a really, really important piece of it. That's fantastic. And someone mentioned the phones being the modern wave of technology, obviously, that we didn't have back then. But speaking of, someone submitted the question, how will generative AI impact the future of the business? Um, I'm just going to go for Lila, if you can please weigh in on that. I think um, we don't know. <laughs> I certainly don't know. It could be anything and everything. Um, and um, I think, you know, the hope is that it becomes um, an asset to us and does not take all our jobs away. Thank Anyone you for else want to jump in? I would say actually like, dig into it as a tool, like learn how to use it. It's not going away. Um, the only thing we can do is embrace it. Like, I don't think the human element of making art is ever going to be replaced, but it's going to become a more and more ever present part of both our business and the making of art. And I think the only thing we can do is like learn how to use it more than just reject it. Um, can I add the, on the flip side now, business people and the streamers all have so much information about when people pay attention and when they don't. Um, and it impacts the way executives deal with you on the creative side. Um, they're like at five minutes that, you know, people, you know, click, 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 they're not paying attention because Facebook is also sending. So they know when you're, when you're, when you're going to your phone. And so there is something that is happening that is going to impact um, it's going to impact the creative parts. Um, so I would agree to lean into it and pay attention to it. I'm noticing in the chat, the discussion about New York versus LA. And, and I didn't mean for it to be a, a, you know, East Coast, West Coast battle, because definitely there are opportunities in New York. Um, I, I, in no way did I mean there wasn't. So just be clear, you know, to my fellow actor friends that I've seen, putting things in the chat. Yes, there's work in New York, Atlanta, you know, LA, it's, there's work everywhere. You And again, you can create your own work wherever you want. So I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, ladies, I do appreciate your time and everyone's time that's joined the call today. I know Lorna has some final words and with that, we will conclude. Okay, thank you, Elle. Thank you, Victoria, for moderating. Ladies, It um, I am so thrilled that this was finally happening. Um, I want the audience to know it took us almost two years to get this going. And these ladies have stuck with it um, and um, and have met and, and revamped this thing and we moved it around, but here we are and it is Women History Month. And, um, and I just want to say how proud I am of this panel. And, um, and I'm hoping that we can do a part two sometime. Um, and, um, and thank you all again for your time and your effort and your talents that you bring. Um, and you bring it every day. And we are absolutely proud. Um, and, um, and thank you. And have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Good evening. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.